Hey guys, I'm just taking a few seconds before I start the video to show you uh, different implementations of the pattern that I'm going to show you. Here, for example, uh, in the middle of the screen, uh, we kind of have one implementation of the data injection. Those two components here with the two ores or mine rolls, that's another implementation of the pattern. Same for the veins. And if you go to crafting, uh, again, same thing here, this recipe is an implementation of that pattern. If you go to the inventory, same thing. Each individual sword here is using the data injection pattern to receive data to display. Of course, same thing for the data on the top part of the screen. And yeah, I use this pattern everywhere, so I really want to share that with you. Hey guys, today we are talking about a programming pattern which actually I don't really know if it exists. I just assume that something similar exists because most of the time I make my own patterns. But uh, yeah, we are talking about data injection pattern. The reason why we talk about this today is because I wanted to make a Godot pattern video. But I realized that the pattern that I wanted to show you, which is Godo specific, which is kind of cool, um, is actually requiring and using the data injection pattern. So if you don't know how to make a data injection first, uh, it is kind of kind of a problem. So let's jump into this pattern and how to implement it and how it's useful. The data injection pattern is allowing you to make a simple bridge simple entry point, simple connection that different items in your program will be able to use to give instructions to a component so that it updates its behavior, its properties. Uh, there are many things you can change with that. So for the sake of this video, I created a few things beforehand. So we have here in the UI a component. So if you don't know what a component is, it's just a word, a fancy word to say a scene. But I make the difference between components and views just so that when we have a bunch of scenes, we know what is their purpose and we can kind of filter a little bit the, the, the amount of scenes we have. So a component is a scene which is meant to be reused a lot of times. And I oppose this concept to views, which are kind of meant to be instantiated ones. The data injection pattern can technically be used on both types of scenes. But here we will see how this applies to components. So I created two things in this project. Uh, we have this component here which is a text rectangle, a name, and a value, two labels. And also I created a database for items. So I defined an item resource with a name, a texture path, a value, and a key. And then I created a simple database which initialize when you call on this function, which is public. So here we have the default values of this component. And what we want is to be able to say, component, please display the value of this item, which is an emerald with this texture and this specific value. In order to achieve this, we have different ways to approach in the sense that you can make the things in a different order. It will not matter very much. Here, uh, I will start just by scripting the different properties, the different nodes, because right now they're, they're static and hard coded. So we're going to create a script to change these nodes. So here we're just creating a, a simple class for this component. And it is actually quite important to give it a name because when you want another object in your program to be able to inject data in this component, uh, having a class name is very useful. So first we will 
create a property, a variable, which will contain the item or the resource that we want to display. So here we just create an item variable. And after that, we will create a method which will be responsible for updating the different nodes of our scene based on the item we want to display, the resource we want to display. So I usually name this update. Uh, it's up to you to choose how you want to rename this thing. Uh, update, in my opinion, is kind of general, so it makes sense. So anyway, what we want is to update the value, the name, and the text rectangle. So I will make these nodes unique to make the maintainability, scalability of this component a little bit better so that we can move them around without breaking things. And now what I want to do is to apply the values. So the texture rectangle, which is going to be a texture rect, uh, we want to set its texture. We want to set its texture by loading all right, uh, let's say no. So the auto completion here is a little bit broken when we load, but we basically want to load the texture path in the item. We also want to update the name and the value, which are two labels. And here we just want to change the text to the item name. And for the second one, we just want to change the value to the value in the item, item value. For the value, I'm adding a little bit of text to contextualize the information. And there we go, item value. So right there, this is the fastest, easiest way to implement this texture updating, etc. But uh, it is very likely that you may want to have some safety nets. For example, you never know if you may have this function being called with an empty item, empty resource. So you may choose to say that, all right, we're going to check if the item is different than null. So if it is not null, we will do this thing right there. And else, if it is null, uh, we will use default values. So these values, we are going to load right there the cat box. So we're going to copy the UID, link this, and we're going to say that the name is box and the value is uh, not node. Like this. So this way, if we receive a broken item, we have we have this of course we are not safe uh, fully safe yet because one part of the item could be missing for example let's say that you have a broken item you have the texture you don't have the name but you have the value so when you try to fetch the name here you're gonna have a problem so uh, there are different ways to deal with that so either you can set each individual property to its this kind of if if else right so for example you go if the item texture exists then i set the item texture otherwise i will use this default one and you can do this for every property another way for example would be to have a check on your item, which checks the integrity of the item. So in your item object, you just run through every properties to see if one, if they are all uh, assigned. And if they are not, you may declare the object as corrupted, or you may decide to use a default value. That's up to you to choose this kind of things. So anyway, I think that's enough of the update of the textures yet and the properties. And now we'll think about the actual data injection. So injecting data is as easy basically as changing this value here, this item and set the item. But just changing this property doesn't trigger the update function. 
which is why we're going to use a specific function to receive the data and then do all the necessary actions in this component uh, after we have received data. So you can use getters and setters if this is something you really enjoy. But here we're going to use a full method. For the name, again, it's really up to you and, well, you choose the one that makes the most sense for you. It could be set data, it could be set item, it could be inject item, it could be inject data. Here, I'm going to stay kind of neutral and say that it's going to be inject data. And then we'll take an item data as an argument. So I will implement an error just to show you how to use errors here. So by default, it's going to return OK when everything's fine. But first, uh, we want to check that the item is existing. So we're going to check that if item is not null. So we're going to nullify this if the item... Well, actually, no, we're going to... Here we are looking for errors. So if the item is null, uh, we're going to return fail. And we are not going to update this component. OK, so now we have an object which is not null. And maybe we have checked the integrity. We could check this here. But anyway, we just want the private item in the class properties to take the value of the item we have received in the data injection. Here, after we have received the data, we update the component to show the updated properties. All right, so from the this component is able to receive data, but the question is how do you send data in? So you have different ways to do that, and yeah, it's up to you to be creative and to find how to have your different objects communicate with each other. And here we will see some very basic ways to implement the data without having another object in the game responsible for injecting the data, and we will just use the Godot inspector scene tree to do that. So first let's try to see how we can inject the data just by hard coding this in the script. So just to see the difference, we're going to run the game uh, right now to see that, yeah, we rerun the game and we have this box with an, amp an unknown value. We will go in our script and when we are ready, we are going to create an item here. And this item can either be one which we create manually by saying that we're creating a new item and setting every property one by one. Uh, let's actually go in the database and copy uh, this, for example. No, we have a cat here. So let's copy this. Here we have the item, we set all the informations. Uh, we have the key, so it's an enum from item. We just have to specify where the enum comes from. And there we go. After that, we can inject the data and the item. So if we do rerun the game, we indeed have a not dead cat. So that is, that is one way. Another way here would be, for example, to read uh, the database. So the item could be equal to, well, item.dictionary and item item. We want to see uh, that cat, for example. First, uh, we have to initialize this database because usually you have this done at the start of the script, I mean, of, of the game, but we don't really have a game here, so we have to do that here. We initialize the database, we read the dead cat from there, and we do have a dead cat in the box. So this is fun and all, but the problem is that uh, the script is attached to this component and it's not really reusable, if we can say that. So what we can do is, for example, have something different. We could export well, not really the item, but we could export the variable, which would be the item e. All right. So we go to e item dot enum, and we actually want to set 
this variable here. And what we do is that we want to inject data and the data we want to inject is item.dictionary of item key. And of course, we want to initialize the dictionary here. Okay, so now that it is saved, we, we are able to choose what is the item that we want to display. So we can rerun the scene and we'll see that we have a sapphire here. Now let's actually think about a situation where you have different instances of this component. So let's create another scene, which is going just to be a test view for, uh, you're gonna say UI item test view. So in there, what I will do is just set a vertical box at the center of my screen, and I will initialize our UI item component twice in there. So we're gonna put it twice, one, two, and we actually are able to change what we are displaying. So we'll display the sapphire and the emerald in the first one. So we can run the game and see that we indeed have the emerald and the sapphire in two different components. So from there, you can instantiate this component as many times as you wish. And all you have to do is to change the data which is set in. So that's pretty much it. We're kind of done with explaining this component in a situation where you're not relying on external objects to inject the data and use either the editor or the ready function. But anyway, patterns are not uh, something that are static. It is very important for you to be creative, to use those patterns in ways which are useful for you. Uh, be creative, use the flexibility of programming, all the flexibility it offers you, and that will allow you to create some very cool thing. Don't be afraid of creating your own patterns, of taking a pattern which already exists and twist it to fit to what you like to do. Anyway, uh, I will see you later for another pattern, which is the first go-to pattern that we will talk about, which is the list pattern, where we will be using this data injection and we will see how we can maintain lists of components by using the good of features. I hope you did enjoy this and that this will be useful for your programs and your games. If that was a little bit too cryptic, please say that in the comment because I'm sometimes not realizing that I'm skipping some steps. And yeah, I will see you in whatever content you choose to watch and you keep practicing how to make games and stuff because that's how you will have fun making fun games.